Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to the Better Than Cash Alliance and CGAP webinar on uh, COVID-19 and managing liquidity and cash out during COVID-19 social payments. I'm Camilo, the head of research and innovation at the Better Than Cash Alliance, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Emilio Hernandez, a senior specialist at CGAP, who will be moderating today. For those who don't know, the Alliance is a partnership of governments, companies, and international organizations, all committed to moving away from cash to some sort of digital payment to accelerate their progress towards sustainable development goals. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, this is Emilio Hernandez from CGAP. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to be with you all. This is the third in our series of webinars on learning from members about responding to COVID-19. And this time, we're doing this together with our friends at SIGA in response to our members. In fact, liquidity and distribution is an issue that came up as a key concern in the previous exchanges, and we wanted to be responsive to your needs. We have over 500 registrations and have participants from every region in the world. And I would like to give a especially warm welcome to the members of the Alliance, the governments, as well as to the members of SIGA. This webinar is being recorded, so you can always come back and listen to it. You can always ask questions via Q&A, a chat box that we have uh, set up. My colleague, Parisa, will be collating all the questions received for the final discussion. Before I introduce our wonderful speakers, we would like to set the context and briefly go through the agenda today. The COVID-19 pandemic is primarily a health crisis and a human tragedy, but it also has far-reaching economic ramifications. It is already disrupting millions of livelihoods with disproportionate impact on poor households and small and informal businesses. It has also exposed important challenges when it comes to distribution of digital financial services. As cash flow is changing, liquidity management has become an issue for many stakeholders. So in order to tackle this topic on our agenda, uh, we'll first start with a brief snapshot on India, Kenya, and the MTN Group, one of the largest MNOs in Africa in regards to COVID-19 and digital payments. Second, we will share the key challenges in solving distribution, highlighting the issues that many providers have faced in managing liquidity and collaborative models. Finally, we'll shed some light on lessons learned for COVID-19 before opening up the floor for questions. Let's get started. First, I would like to give a warm welcome to Ishwar Venkateswaran. Mr. Ishwar is the Chief Operating and Technology Officer at India Post Payments Bank, which is a public bank that aims to utilize all of India's 150,000 post offices as accent points for financial services. Second, we have Dr. Milka Chebi, Milka is a social protection payment specialist at FSD Kenya, and she's also an advisor to the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection in Kenya on social payments, where she has been involved in the design and successful implementation of the Inwa Jami program. And finally, Mr. Fraz Lubega. He's the MFS commercial and go-to market for MTN Group. MTN, as you many of you know, is one of the leading MNO groups in the world with presence in over 20 markets. A warm welcome to everyone, and now on to our agenda. Yes, uh, we'd like to start with each of our speakers giving a quick overview of the use of a distribution channel in delivering G2P payments in their respective markets and the new challenges emerging as a result of COVID-19. We'd like to start with uh, Iswaran from India Post Payment Banks, nominated by the government of India's Department of Post, who has recently been praised by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi on their COVID-19 leadership. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you so much and good morning to um, all of you and good afternoon to, to others. Okay, let's, let's get on with the, with the numbers out here. We are here we are talking of the direct benefit transfers, we call it DBT in India. It's an attempt to change the mechanism of transferring subsidies launched by the government of India. And the DBT program aims to transfer subsidies directly to the people, to the bank accounts, um, and eliminating all the intermediaries and reducing the leakages and, and the delays. And while, while we still look at the numbers, uh, I'll come to the numbers on top of it. 
What are the key enablers here? We had something known as the Aadhaar and the India Stack. The India Stack is a set of technology interfaces which actually allow government, businesses, fintechs to connect and develop digital infrastructure. The Aadhaar infrastructure was created sometime in 2009 to provide the national identity uh, for over 1.2 billion Aadhaar endorsements as of now and uh, more than 36 billion authentications as on December uh, 2019. Uh, it's an open architecture and uh, that has been one of the key enablers, allows interoperable payments and settlement systems such as the unified payment interfaces and uh, other enabled payment systems. There have been various inter uh, interventions from the government and regulators. The, the, um, the most famous was the, the Jandhan Yojana, as we call it, was started in 2014 with basic bank accounts, with a, some bit of overdraft facilities. Over 377 million accounts with balances over a trillion is, as on September 19, it have grown up in the last six months. The G2P and the direct benefit transfers, over 26.4 billion um, transactions have been transacted into these accounts. Digital and financial literacy programs have been big enablers using banks, fintechs, microfinance institutions. They drive by holding cams, awareness, drives, etc. There have been proactive central bank practices to allow uh, electronic KYC and other simplified digital processes for providing access to the rural population. Actually, India has been achieve, uh, able to achieve uh, in 10 years what normally would have taken more than 46 years to achieve. That's the, the industry standards. We go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, here, <clears throat> here we're talking of India Post being um, payments bank as banking as, as a service. Taking the, I mean, we're taking the Jandan drive forward, the government of India had made strategic infrastructure investments in creating the last mile interoperable banking network, leveraging the reach of Department of Post. Department of Post is, is, is one of the oldest institutions known, I mean, known for the postal services. Now they are known for the financial services too. The launch of the government owned payments bank was there on September 1st, 2018. We have 650 branches. We have 136,078 post offices who are buying access points. We use 1,89,750 postmen or Gramin dark savings as we call for the last step, those step um, providers. Most importantly, I want to mention here is 50% of the end users or the Gramin dark savings as we call are women. So that's a, that's a great thing for us. And it's been established as an uh, interoperable banking infrastructure uh, for the public good, and that can serve customers of any bank, thereby extending the reach of rural banking network almost 2.5 times, and that's a phenomenal number uh, looking at the geography of India. By leveraging the aadhaar payment systems, IPBB has been able to fulfill the government of India's objective of having an interoperable banking access point within 5 kilometers of any household, and creating alternate accessibility for the 377 million Jandan account holders. Customers of any bank can access their Aadhaar linked account by simply using their fingerprint, the biometric for cash withdrawal, balance inquiry, transfer of funds into, an, in, into any operating IPPB account right at their doorstep, postman and the uh, Gramin dark savings. And we have been, uh, I mean, uh, uh, senior citizens, pregnant women, students, uh, different able have been served during the uh, COVID situation. <clears throat> How has this been operationalized? If, if you ask me, uh, we had the infrastructure ready, we had the, the postman ready, the access points ready, they had been armed with biometric devices and ready to go. We, we are happy to announce that we have opened new accounts during the lockdown period between the fourth week of March to date, almost 3.9 million accounts. Cash out services provider has been over 8.7 million transactions, valuing over uh, 220 millions. Uh, total transactions over 28 millions have been transacted uh, during the last um, eight weeks of, of uh, lockdown. And this all has been carried with social distancing and with sanitization of the biometric. So, and that's, uh, and that's a phenomenal activity which has been carried out. Um, over 146 million disbursed in beneficiary accounts 
uh, we have been helping migrant laborers, as I told you, senior citizens, the rural employment guaranteed workers, everybody has been used to have been able to utilize these services at that, at that doorsteps, thanks to the infrastructure which has been created on, on the backbone of Department of Post and India Post Payments Bank. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very, more, very much, Mr. Ishwar. Uh, those numbers are very impressive. And, and in fact, I, I heard recently that the Department of Post uh, has been praised by Prime Minister Modi on their COVID-19 leadership. So congratulations. I would like Thank to now so give the opportunity to Dr. Chebby uh, to tell us about the Kenyan context. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Kenya now stands at 83% financially included uh, adults in the country, uh, coming from just 26% in the year 2006, and formerly none ex excluded being 11%. This is quite impressive a journey for Kenya, uh, you know, leveraging on the Impesa that just started in 2007. Therefore, a lot of digital penetration across the country. Looking at the data, we have about 41% of adult Kenyans having bank accounts and 33% being female having bank accounts. But in terms of access to mobile connectivity, we have about 83% uh, Kenyans who have access to mobile phones, which is again, like I said, you know, coming right from the depending of uh, MPESA uh, since 2007. Um, a survey that was done by FinTechs the, the other uh, 2017 shows that about 79% of Kenyans made either receiving or paying monies through digital, and that is quite an impressive percentage, and much of it being rural at 73%. It just puts into context that, again, we need to do a lot of um, uh, agency model rollout into the rural because that's again where beneficiaries and other Kenyans are accessing their money. Within the context of the country, we have a constitutional responsibility uh, to provide for um, Kenyans that are unable to provide for themselves. It is in fact in our constitution and therefore Kenya has taken that step to ensure that vulnerable Kenyans are onboarded into safety net programs. In addition to that, we have a wider perspective to, to, to ensure that beneficiaries are onboarded. Over the years since 2004, with just 500 uh, beneficiaries household, we have about 320 million US dollars allocated to safety net programs. And so far we have reached 1.3 million and being offered uh, by various uh, financial service providers, just creating competitiveness around choice for the beneficiaries. And the latest uh, design model was iterated by government in 2018, just bringing you know, choice to beneficiaries to choose from where they can collect their money and which bank they would want to. They get about $439 every two months. Uh, the four programs are targeting vulnerable that include elderly uh, persons with disabilities and, and account uh, usage is encouraged. But should anyone use a mobile connectivity, it is required that every six months they move to a touch point and, and ensure that their biometrics are there. In terms of COVID um, uh, impact on, on Kenyans, a uh, few surveys were done and Kenyans were asked whether it, it has been very easy to access money or whether COVID has impacted them significantly. And most of them yellow and the blue and the black are saying it, it has really impacted their income negatively. And whether they're able to access any money, a large majority of them are, are not able to access. But government has been at the forefront in ensuring that, you know, these uh, Kenyans are given some, some safety landing and additional 10, million US dollars uh, were added to beneficiary. There's a lot of stimulus package targeting vulnerable sectors like the health sector, SMEs, and again, a raft of uh, tax relief to various sectors, uh, economical uh, levels for beneficiaries and, and Kenyans that are earning less than, than, than percentage. And again, banks are also doing a lot of waivers and longer term loan repayments to just enable their clients to wither through this uh, uh, pandemic. Next, please. And again, just looking at the impact on agent liquidity, um, again, a survey just done uh, towards the mid of April, uh, 
we were asking uh, customers whether they are, they are getting their money through the agents and 72% of them felt the liquidity was still available within their agent outlet. But immediately there were tax, uh, there were commission uh, transaction fees waived. A majority of Kenyans, 50% uh, for urban, felt that the liquidity uh, being available, but percentage of transactions reduced because uh, commission fees were waived. So this puts into the context the fact that at each point, uh, they will feel the reduction of, uh, of the transaction fees and maybe looking into the next slide how agents can be remunerated during such times of COVID so that they don't feel the impact of uh, reduction of transaction fees. Next. Next. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Milka. Uh, that was uh, that was a great introduction to Kenya. It's uh, it's impressive to see how ready you were and how you've been supporting the agent network to remain active. Uh, perhaps now it's a good transition to look at uh, the private sector point of view from a provider stand, and uh, we welcome Frey from NTN so he can give us a view of the group's Pan African perspective when it comes to the digitization of G2B payments. Frey, welcome. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good day, good morning and good afternoon to everyone listening. Um, yes, uh, the option that I'm actually going to cover is specifically for the Kingdom of Isotini and um, our measures that have been put in place by the Kingdom through the Deputy Prime Minister's office to uh, uh, support the disadvantaged in society. So basically, elderly and uh, disability social grants are paid to uh, this, uh, uh, this disadvantaged uh, uh, population. And the government has taken an, a view that using uh, you know, digital payments is actually the best option, especially uh, during the COVID times because of advantages it provides. And um, through that engagement, uh, over 57,700 uh, elder grant payees were paid or are paid every month and uh, 5,200 disability grant payees are paid, um, making a total of 62,900 beneficiaries that were paid through MTN. Now, uh, these payments are done through a public-private partnership, and there are a couple of other payers or uh, uh, banks and MNOs that uh, participate in these payments. So a total of uh, almost a million US dollars, 950,000 US dollars were paid in April. And uh, uh, basically uh, these are ongoing payments every month the government pays and they continue to pay uh, through uh, this uh, uh, process. Now MTN was quite prepared because uh, the, the country is not so huge. Uh, so the population is slightly over a million um, number of uh, customers registered on um, GSM, a slight of a million, of which around 460 are active on mobile money. So, and we are serving them every month. So in terms of a distribution network, we have to serve them 5,700 active agents. So when these elderly were paid or are paid, uh, they don't have an issue on accessing the money they want or liquidity issues because of you know, the agent base being very active and the customer base being active. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Reis. Um, and thank you to all our panelists for this first introduction. Now we move uh, to our next section where we'll discuss in more detail some of the challenges on distribution during COVID times. Um, just to frame the discussion, I'll be sharing um, a little bit of what CGAP has been reviewing across the globe, talking with providers and agents and customers about um, some of the main challenges that we see cross-border more regionally. And first is, uh, I'd like to make six points. Um, first is, uh, there's an issue, I'd like to talk first about the short-term um, requirements or challenges that you have immediately. First is the definition of agent networks as an essential business. Um, many countries have um, done that uh, as a means to keep their agent networks operational and be able to distribute G2P payments through them. But there, there needs to be a lot of clarity in terms of what is an agent, uh, because many of these agents are non-dedicated, meaning that they have a lot of several other business lines in addition to mobile money or DFS services. And so when local authorities reach out um, 
they might not really see an agent, they might see a grocer or a, or a miscellaneous shop and, um, and they might you know, ask them to close down. So having this clarity and of instructions uh, going all the way to local authorities is important if agents are, are deemed essential. Now, the second point is that even if when you declare agents essential, keeping them open um, is a challenge. And I think uh, uh, Milka's presentation touched on that a bit because many, like we said, many of these agents, a large share of their income has dropped during lockdown. Those non-dedicated like grocers or um, office supplies, et cetera, <clears throat> so um, it's very difficult for them to remain open um, with their fixed costs without any additional support. So there's an implicit cost there as well. And for provider side, there may be some additional cost as well to remain operational. Um, for banks or, 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 or mobile money agents that depend on bank branches, these bank branches um, to remain open also incur costs given the low uh, activity rates that they have lower transactions than usual. Um, so agents depend on that to um, manage their liquidity. But in addition, uh, they may be incurring in uh, costs related to staff safety, right? And then the third point is that, you know, to deal with those very immediate challenges, there needs to be a mix, a very close dialogue and coordination among um, uh, governments and, and financials and providers and agent networks, right? There, there's probably a mix of temporary incentives that governments can put in place, like, for example, access to interest revenue to escrow accounts, direct subsidy for agents in rural areas, or adequate and tier provider fees to distribute GDP funds, because the cost of distributing GDP may change in COVID times. Next slide, please. And now looking a little bit more forward um, uh, in terms of um, building more resilient agent networks um, to recover from the crisis and prevent future crises or be ready for future crises. One thing is that you, you, there, there is momentum right now to start certain investments that make distribution channels more resilient. And we're, we're seeing that there's an opportunity here for governments to um, apply policies that perhaps have been discussed to open up uh, the number of providers that are allowed to distribute GDP. So the traditional way that usually the government um, through a vendor a contract um, uh, gets one supplier to distribute and then all beneficiaries are just asked to go to that supplier. But given the challenges of distribution, um, it's a good policy to open up the choice to various providers so that the beneficiary has the choice of going to that provider that is closer or more convenient to them. So these are policies that we've seen um, um, uh, are raised in importance in this context. Also, it's important for once you've got GDP um, programs set up, um, especially those related to COVID, it's important to monitor um, its, its performance and what's happening at the beneficiary level on the ground. We see that um, not many programs report cash out failures that I think it's important to monitor to see what kind of issues beneficiaries are having in order to get their money out. Or um, monitor as well unclaimed GDP deposits, which also happen uh, because either the customer, the beneficiary didn't know uh, it received a benefit, or it can be very costly for, the, for very vulnerable or remote uh, beneficiaries to access that, that fund. And so it remains unclaimed. And the, the last point is that as all of this you know, pandemic takes place, um, things are changing drastically and we see the nature of DFS transactions um, it, by many providers changing. And there's a slight tendency of an increase on bill payments, digital bill payments, and a slight decrease in P2P transactions that are smaller value and more frequent. So we, we, I think these are things that we, we don't know if they're going to be permanent or not, how sticky they're going to be. But if they are and, and they remain over time, it's important to check whether that reflects any dropout or of the most vulnerable um, clients or customers, right? Um, which um, may be because, you know, uh, small, you know, poor customers do small value, high frequency DFS transactions and depend on struggling agents to do it. So they may be the ones who are suffering, whereas the better off are maybe doing much more transactions. And even though we see a net gain in DFS transactions, it might be that we're, we're losing some of the lower income customers. 
So that'd be something that people interested in financial inclusion should monitor. With that, I'll, I'll, I'll set the stage um, for our next um, uh, transition. So Frace, would, would you like to share a bit more uh, details on the, the distribution challenges that MTN has been having and some of the measures he's been putting in place? Uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, so um, as MTN uh, being a Pan-African uh, provider and especially with mobile money active in 16 of our 21 countries, um, we actually have to deal with a number of initiatives, number of difficulties, especially under COVID uh, time, uh, because one, our distribution network was considered essential in most of our jurisdictions. So most of our countries permitted the uh, mobile money agents to remain open to serve the public because they considered the service they were offering as uh, critical. Uh, secondly, um, our distribution network, you know, in terms of uh, costs of maintenance, ensuring that uh, they are active, uh, they are open, they are rebalanced and they have either float or cash to serve our customers whenever needed. Uh, those costs increased because of one, um, uh, when it comes to bank opening hours, uh, the banks basically, some of the branches were not open uh, whenever needed as, as they used to open before COVID. And then secondly, uh, some of them didn't even open and it required someone traveling longer distances to come and rebalance themselves, either get float or cash. Uh, so we had to deal with those. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, commissions that are paid uh, for, for you know, partners that go and rebalance for us, super agents, uh, distribution partners, and uh, fr freelance rebalancers, we have to look, look into how best you know, we um, uh, increase and facilitate them to consider you know, the long distances, the extra spend. So they, you know, support them more. Uh, in terms of liquidity management, it became a major challenge because uh, suddenly where an agent was able to rebalance themselves from within uh, one kilometer, two kilometers, or the rebalancing partner who is supporting liquidity management was able to deliver within a few kilometers. Some of their outlets were closed and it meant that we had to experience liquidity challenges, um, which we then overcame with additional you know, liquidity considerations. Uh, one, give them more credit um, in terms of an agent. Two, make bank push-pull available for them uh, so that uh, if they run out of float, they can actually pull funds from their bank account. And we actually made it free across our, our footprint uh, so that they can pull those funds for free and, and uh, send the funds back into the bank for free. And then three, making cash available um, to them through super agents, so that was quite costly. Then the last element that I'll cover is the agent network management, uh, which also became quite costly because some of uh, our, our teams that trade development reps that are supposed to be uh, are supervising this agent network were not considered essential. So some of them were actually closed down. The ones that were able to get permits to move around quite, became quite costly because they had to move longer distances. You know, it became uh, quite uh, difficult for us. <clears throat> then, um, next slide. <clears throat> so um, in, we had to basically lower the cost of use of our services to encourage customers to leave the funds onto the ecosystem instead of withdrawing them and depositing, because normally the behavior of our customers is um, they use a wallet as a transient uh, account, and whenever they receive money, they go cash it out. Whenever they need to spend and send money across, they go deposit it back again and send it across. So we made peer-to-peer -peer transactions free, and that saw a very substantial increase in number of transactions though it crushed our revenues because now we didn't have revenues from those transactions. Um, some of our countries experienced up to 400% increase within one month in terms of peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions. Then we made bank to wallet free and at the same time wallet to bank so you could send money into your bank account and pull it at no cost. And then B2B payments. So if someone was a merchant receiving payments from customers, 
and they wanted to pay another business to make that free, as well as uh, you know, customer to business and business to customer. So that we encourage the funds to stay on the ecosystem and people did not have to, you know, go and cash out. Um, second point I would like to make is we made a lot of uh, a progress thanks to the support of regulators because regulators were quite collaborative in most jurisdictions and um, quite progressive in their change in policies. So allowing uh, you know, free P2P transfers, crushing the revenues, knowing you're going to crush taxes that the governments are going to receive. They came to the party on us, on supporting us on that. Thirdly, in terms of uh, liquidity management, so super agents, um, financial institutions, FMCGs, and, and other partners that were playing a part, those that were open uh, supported us uh, substantially to ensure that you know, we had no liquidity management issues in the trade uh, where possible. And then the last bit is the risk-based approach on customer due diligence. Um, you know, in most jurisdictions, we are required to uh, do very enhanced due diligence before we allow the customer to onboard and utilize services. So many of our governments allowed or regulators allowed that if a customer has uh, you know, identification documents, but maybe missing one of the parameters or one of the requirements, uh, onboard them, give them a low profile uh, wallet where they cannot transact up to the normal customers, but allow them to use, utilize the service and enjoy the service. So then regularize them immediately after COVID, which uh, helped a lot. So now on the next slide, um, if MTN Rwanda and specifically the Rwanda uh, uh, government and regulator, uh, very good collaboration between uh, uh, the government, uh, which enabled an increase in you know peer-to-peer -peer transactions up to two to eight eight percent just within week on week, and then um, in terms of volume, three ninety seven percent increase in peer-to-peer -peer transactions, and value increased by four eighty five percent. So that basically talks the extent to which if we made these transactions more free, um, maybe as free as cash, then that is the extent to which we can actually generate more volumes. And then because of making bank to wallet and wallet to bank free, um, you know, wallet to bank increased by two, to 17%, uh, coming off a smaller base and then bank to wallet increased by one three three percent coming off a bigger base. So that talks to the extent, and this is, uh, you know, comparing Jan transactions to April transactions uh, for the full month. Then um, in terms of uh, merchants, because we made a customer to merchant free and merchant to customer free, 257% increase. And then um, of course, uh, because of a closure and you know transactions rotating in the ecosystem, cash outs decreased, which was what we intended to do, maintain the cash, I mean the transactions on the ecosystem and discourage customers cashing out and um, having that risk of you know uh, spreading COVID through our uh, nodes. So uh, in summary, um, very progressive uh, regulator um, uh, in, in Rwanda because most of the engagements that we have with the regulators, uh, they, they actually come through to support, but specifically that regulator allowed tripling of the, the wallets. So one wallet uh, uh, was actually uh, allowed to transact up to three times what they had originally been allowed. And then the regulator themselves took an industry-wide view and instituted an independent study to monitor the impact of you know, the framework changes they had made and uh, with very good results. So if you look at what I've quoted on peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, those results are thanks to the regulators uh, study that they did. Uh, these were issued, a report was issued by Next Billion um, after that. And then, um, you know, liquidity management through banks, master agents and super agents were implemented easier because now wallet to bank and bank to wallet was made free. Um, you know, we afforded longer um, credit to, to um, our agents so that they can be able to support. And then even considering capital injections after lockdown in most of our jurisdictions were operating. Thank you so much.
Okay, then um, I think I'll move on to the uh, opportunities that we have for additional collaboration. You know, as operators, sometimes you compete, um, but we also have a chance to collaborate to enhance, uh, you know, what, what we can offer. So uh, between MTN and Orange, uh, we've actually come up with a joint venture called uh, Mobile, Mobile Wallet Interoperability, Mowali. Uh, where uh, we've allowed, you know, we've started um, uh, with the wallet to wallet interoperability, where, for example, from Uganda, I can send funds to um, an orange wallet holder in Cote d'Ivoire um, easily cross border. Nationally, we've also allowed that. So, as, as MTN, I can send transactions to um, an MTN within, for example, Cote d'Ivoire, Orange Cote d'Ivoire, and MTN Cote d'Ivoire, and the funds will, will, will go. And uh, basically, this has allowed a number of opportunities. And the intention is to move uh, to the next level where we'll allow you know, e commerce uh, uh, merchant interoperability, where a customer from, say, one country can go to a merchant acquired by Orange, the customer is an MTN customer, and pay using their wallet without us to, uh, to have them to do anything. Then at the next level, we shall have in agent interoperability where an Orange agent or an MTN agent can serve an Orange customer and vice versa. So that will enable then, you know, us not to compete where we don't need to compete, we collaborate and enhance the services that we offer to our customers. Then a lot of data analytics uh, is being done to improve you know, the ability to serve and create more value for our customers because a lot of insights sit in that data, whether it's GSM data or mobile money data, you can know, for example, the movement of customers and you can estimate how much you, you need in terms of capillarity of um, um, liquidity in an area. If customers are migrating to that area, you can go and serve them properly uh, based on data analytics. So uh, basically, you, those are the, 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 the initiatives. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Fraze. That, that was very useful. We proceed now to take a, a, a bit more detailed look at the case of India, uh, Mr. Iswar. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in the post, we, uh, I, I come to the, the slide where we were saying how to reach the accessibility. Today, if you look at it, the department of post is our uh, single single uh, BC uh, because we, we are leveraging on, on the department of post for all our cash management needs as well as uh, all our product needs. Most of our products are aligned uh, with the, with, I mean, with the, with the way Department of Post customers are, are, are behaving. So, in fact, we have also set up a, a post info app, as we call, which is very user friendly to use. Any bank customer can log in, register the details such as a name, address, and location, and request for certain type of services. It can be postal services, it can also be a, a India Post Payments Bank services, which are available as a drop down. The data is centrally disseminated to the various post offices based on the, the, the PIN codes, which is the, the location codes in India. And the door steps are arranged accordingly from those respective post offices. Uh, believe me, there are 186,000 handheld devices equipped with biometric system, which are used for authentication and for the various uh, payments processing. Of course, because uh, digital being our, our main strength and that's being our part of the journey, we, all, we want to reduce the the cash used in the ecosystem and we are also signing up and equipping uh, small merchants with QR codes which are very very user friendly to use scan it and and uh, make make the payment so which can be adapted uh, very very quickly cash management is, is something which we want to we want to keep keep reducing the so liquidity management always poses to be uh, a challenge uh, and uh, we, are, we are talking of uh, 3 lakh postal workers uh, across 155,000 offices. Uh, challenge is also to ensure all these post offices, all these access points which are all rural in nature to be activated with networks in, uh, in place, uh, proper power, electricity, in infrastructure in place. So that's also one of the biggest challenges as, as, we, as we go about our 
day to day functions uh, next slide please yeah as as we look uh, look look into the future it's a, it's very exciting as we as we look at it we we want to be the uh, offer the complete bouquet of, of government services which we call as the um service centers we want to be a single window to for offer uh, enrollment uh, dbt seeding related cash out in a single single point and utility bills at the doorstep we also want to become a banking as a service this is something which we are looking very very excited about where we can deliver all the banking industry services for all the banks any bank customer can access our systems and avail of services it's it's a typical um, a very classic example of uh, public infra network of sorts created by the government of india which can be utilized to deliver to the last mile by any private or public sector bank so we can build partnerships around these we also are looking at as offering a services in the non financial services where we can offer a comprehensive inclusion of healthcare services education services legal legal support where anybody can book a, a doorstep bank come um, the postman will visit his place at the predetermined time open apps there are legal or education or health workers who can advise you over the over the video and uh, i mean so the lal can avail of services which today hither to they were not being able to avail of then all this we are giving service optimization where we we use crm we use data data and analytics where we can customize our our products we can also looking at uh, third party distribution of microfinance of of insurance um, in fact we have already launched a paperless biometric based um, insurance product since the last 6 months and it is doing extremely well okay, so we can we can even make we, we can tailor make products for for the rural population based on their credit history my many of this population don't have a credit history but we can but if we track their behavior pattern their digital spends through various channels we'll be able to customize lot of products for them and and that's something which we are re really uh, looking forward to so we can offer the same products which other parts of the country is getting to the rural rural folk uh, as well so what is it we are, we are looking at we are looking at enabling our professors as digital literacy centers so the step one is to make the 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 three lakh postman digitally literate that's what we are doing it we have almost almost there we we have reached there now we are converting the, the remaining part of of the country into digital literacy and we are we are on the way to make india truly financial inclusive that's 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 what we are doing and the the department of post carries that the trust which has been which has been acknowledged and they have been doing a a great service during covid as well as uh, before covid uh, thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Ishwar. It is really fascinating to see how India Payments Post Bank has really uh, sped forward in terms of innovation, and is really showing globally uh, the um, opportunity that there is in leveraging postal networks for um, access to financial services for people in rural areas. I would like now to give the opportunity to Dr. Chavi. Welcome her back to tell us uh, more about Kenya's uh, Kenya's um, work in expanding consumer choice in GDP. Thank you very much. Uh, the motivation behind the government transition of social payments from manual to to digital transaction was basically to allow um, choice for wider choice for beneficiaries, but more importantly, to look at the efficiencies in terms of delivering these social payments across the country. The journey and the tr transition path has been like almost ten years to move from manual. to electronic and now choice of where beneficiaries can collect their their beneficiary their monies i must hesitate to say that it is not a touch and go it 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 had a, a lot of work has gone into this to just bring beneficiaries to uh, uh, transacting digitally uh, one of it is uh, looking at the operations looking at uh, harmonization and consolidation of all the cash transfers at one point therefore then uh, getting efficiencies going on but again expanding provider choice can only happen if you bring more on board and as i alluded earlier there are more payment service providers now delivering payments to 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 kenyan vulnerable citizens 
and we have four of the PSPs, uh, payment service providers there. But along the side, again, regulation that allowed a non-exclusive level of agents that can deliver social payments across whichever uh, bank that uh, beneficiaries can access their money. And again, as we move into a lot of digital transactions in the country, you know, I mentioned earlier that they said 3% digital transaction. It is important that uh, we look at the leveraging on uh, mobile technology to just enable beneficiaries to collect their money directly from their bank accounts. It has been a very transformational journey by government, and I must, um, uh, you know, at this point mention the, the importance of the private sector in, in, in collaborating with government to just ensure that this happens, because again, you're looking at the viable business, in, in viability of business by the private sector to, to deliver these kind of payments. Next slide, please. And so as, uh, you know, looking at the country Kenya, we have the remotest parts of the country far flung areas, and you have the urban and the, and, and, and the, and the very urban areas. What government had to do was to work together with the, with the payment service providers to, to find a workable, viable business model that can deliver the payments in the remotest parts. So the country was zoned into three levels, zone A, zone B, and zone Z and a model of remunerating the, the payment service providers to deliver in the remotest parts by paying more commission and, 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 and just you know, making the agents operate in, in the remotest parts of the country. This has been quite uh, the, 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 the turnaround of, of many of the providers setting up agents where uh, it at all they would not have set up agents because of uh, viability of the business. But this is not the only model that is working for the country to, to, to just make sure that we expand um, providers in those remote areas. Government also has uh, other uh, interventions, providing connectivity to such uh, remote places, uh, you know, providing electricity to the last mile. There are many other interventions that government are working on this to ensure that the, the remotest parts of the country are connected into this. Next slide, please. Progress to date, as I mentioned earlier, we have over a million beneficiaries now receiving safety net programs and, and targeting for uh, schemes in the country. We have managed to reach over 90% of the beneficiaries across the country and all of them um, operating on a biometric enabled uh, solution, but can be able to pull their money direct from their mobile phones. What I can say at this point is that to be able to, to, to design and implement a successful uh, choice model, payment model in the country, there has been a lot of commitment at the top leadership of the Ministry of the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection just to sustain momentum and improve the program challenges. And more importantly, again, collaboration between the private sector and other supporting partners to, to, to be able to deliver this across the country. I must say that the, the, the journey has been quite uh, transformational. We learn lessons in between, and I will invite you to later look at the case study we have done for Kenya, which I'll be circulating shortly, just documenting lessons that we have done for the country for, for the last uh, over a decade, 204, to, to where we are today. And there are opportunities in iterating such kind of payment solutions. We can't say we are stopping at where we are today, but incrementally we are looking at how the future would look like for social payment solutions in the country. Next, please. Um, looking into the future, I am I'm more alluding to the fact that currently there is a lot of data that we are collecting because of the COVID scenario. Uh, very many private partners, uh, banks, and, and, and philanthropists are collecting data on vulnerable citizens that need support to with us through the COVID scenario. I'm thinking this is an important opportunity to leverage on data and store it, strengthen single registries to inform future programming for, for social payments and emergencies that could arise in the country. It's also important to look at allowing beneficiaries of social payments to switch providers and therefore thinking around at what time of the year they should be able to switch and, and, and just choose that, you know, you, you, you are in one bank today and tomorrow you want to switch to another. I think to create wider choice for beneficiaries, we need to allow that to happen. 
More importantly, right now, we are looking at digital onboarding with minimum KYC, know your customer, and a lot of consumer training. As we move into digital onboarding, digital transactions, it's very key that the private sector, together with government, uh, you know, work on this to ensure that consumers understand the kind of transactions they are doing and what, what it would involve if we go on digital onboarding. Agents right now in the country are really the lifeline of transactions. Um, I would say they are really the frontline uh, essential services that they are offering as government directives and, and banks sending uh, everyone to digital transactions. Everyone now is going to their agent. I think there is an opportunity to really look at the model around the agent uh, transactions. I mean, just that they are maintaining the whole eco digital ecosystem. And so that we don't look at them just like, uh, you know, earning their income from cash transactions, but rather what else are they doing within? So a, a, a review of how the model at agent point would come. But finally, COVID crisis offers important lessons, places where we did not think that we could do digital transactions. This is the time with social distancing. We are all talking about onboarding digitally. We are all talking about digital transaction. Perhaps this is an opportunity for private sector, government, and all MNOs that are able to deepen digital transactions across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Milka. So, uh, I mean, all the different contributions for each of the countries has been uh, extremely interesting. Uh, Kenya always has been teaching us for the last 15 years, really has been at the forefront of the development of digital payments infrastructure. Of course, it's a unique uh, market, uh, but, but there are very important lessons uh, to be learned there and, and good practices. Um, I, let me see if I can just summarize really quickly uh, for our audience some of the key uh, points that we made today. So the first one I think is, is really keep payments working everywhere. Uh, we've touched upon this in the past when we did our Ebola webinar. Really important that uh, governments are flexible and really do what it takes uh, to make sure that uh, to keep the, uh, the infrastructure working, uh, focusing on agent liquidity, uh, lowering KYC when needed, uh, working with all digital payment providers uh, to promote uh, collaboration and inclusion. The second point is, uh, is exactly is, is supporting innovation for the government to really support innovation and the building of infrastructure along with this private sector collaboration. Uh, we see this uh, already happening in some markets, for example, where there's some interesting collaborations happening with uh, super platforms and private companies that are making really great progress in building out the ecosystem. And I think also something that really was clear from, from Kenya, you know, the continuity of leadership, right, at the ministerial level uh, really has been able to sustain momentum and improve uh, program. Uh, third, interoperability drives uptake. Uh, we know this from uh, the case of India, UPI, Bharat QR really have removed the frictions around acceptance points and technologies. Uh, as well, our colleague from MTN really show us the potential that um, uh, Moali uh, as an interoperable platform really can have to accelerate uh, uptake and usage. And of course, the role of agents is critical and, and, and we're starting to see because of this crisis, the, the real uh, need for agent interoperability in some of these markets. And finally, really developing features for merchants to, to support and use and invest. And, uh, and uh, in the future, uh, we've seen this in other cases when, when we discuss the Ebola, is really building for the future, you know, building more resilient distribution channels for the future. And in addition to that, really increase the providers to be able to distribute GDP enabling greater consumer choice. This touches upon some of um, the responsible digital payment practices that the Alliance advocates, and it's good for customers. So uh, with this, we're gonna move over to our Q&A. Um, we are, at the moment, have been receiving lots and lots of questions. Uh, we might, unfortunately, not have too much time for, for questions, but I wanna um, give us a, a start. Uh, I know, Farisa, we've been receiving questions through the chat box, so I wanna give Emilio the, the first one. Thanks, uh, Camilo. Um, the first one is uh, for Mr. Iswar. Uh, you know, the, with the uh, increase in the number of players in the, in the payment space, uh, 
can new players in fintech beyond incumbent banks and menos contribute to addressing the distributional challenges? How is that uh, working out in, in India? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, well, if, if, if you ask us very clearly, uh, there, there are multiple challenges here. The, one part of the challenge is accessibility and the second part of the challenge is adoption of, of the technology. Just, just by creating a distribution network and giving technology will not be able to solve, the, uh, solve all of our problems. We have digital financial literacy, which is, which is uh, one of the uh, prime, prime targets out here. And on the other side, we have a population whose needs need to be understood, they need to be taken care, of, and we need to build custom-made products for them. So there are institutions today who use this technology, who create data, who actually do a lot of analytics and create, uh, you know, provide customer information which actually connects all these dots in order to provide a last mile solution for, for, these, for these customers. So that, that's where the, the challenge lies. So there is this lot of uh, scope here. A lot of, lot of players can, can come in. Who, who are willing to put the effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ishbar. Um, I have another question here for Dr. Chubby. Uh, what government decisions, uh, policy regulations have been critical in achieving mobile money interoperability, uh, wallet to wallet in Kenya, and how could they be potentially advanced at the agent level? Thank you very much. I, I think the most important thing is um, allowing innovation to just be. Uh, don't regulate in innovation. The more you open it up, the better for those who are quite good in innovating and, and, and MNOs just getting into the space of, of payment uh, space to, 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 to do transactions. I think the second part for me is the regulation that opened up agency model in the country uh, early 2009 to, to date has been quite tremendous in just opening up uh, spaces where uh, banks would not have been able to get in there. And, and that is also the same for MNOs, just making that agent uh, model uh, getting out there and, and making it non-exclusive that uh, people can, can access their money. So we are in a digital space that we should then open up innovation to, 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 to allow people to transact more. You will be knowing possibly that uh, M-Pesa itself has now penetrated not just in the MNO sector, but into the payment space. Those are the kind of innovations that we should be talking about. In terms of agent point, again, we should be looking at interoperability. It hasn't matured much in many countries, Kenya included. So we need to look at you know, how agents can be interoperable right from, from the urban to the remote area, even at biometric level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and um, a question, we have a question for Phrase. Um, Phrase, how has bank branch closures and reduced banking hours impacted MTN's own ability to manage liquidity for its channels? And uh, what are some of the strategies that you use to cope with this, with this issue? Thank you for that. Um, so we actually have been quite heavily impacted by bank branch uh, closures because uh, where an agent or a rebalancing partner would have gone to a bank outlet and deposited cash and gotten float within a very short period, they are now having to sometimes move uh, very long distances to go and rebalance themselves everywhere. I mean, elsewhere for them to come and uh, rebalance the trade the way they, they are supposed to. So um, it meant that most of our agents waited longer to get rebalanced. They had to travel longer distances to, 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 to rebalance themselves, and it was quite challenging for us. So some of our initiatives that we then put in place is, you know, uh, for super agents, um, um, you know, taking a like a regional approach, uh, keep maintain more float on your account, uh, very easily pull float from float bank push pull, but then maintain slightly more cash than you normally maintain, so that you can service the channel without requiring yourself to rebalance yourself. Um, and then um, the most important one is encourage digital transactions on the ecosystem, so that you reduce the need for customers to go to an outlet 
to deposit or withdraw. So once they have float on their account, let them rotate, you know, pay P2P, wallet, whatever it is they are paying at no cost to them so that uh, there is no need for them to withdraw. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phrase. Um, so I just want to give uh, our panelists uh, a big thank you. It's been really fascinating. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so, so thank you again for everyone who joined, uh, for the speakers for taking the time to help illuminate this, uh, you know, this really important topic and, and finding ways to, to leverage digital payments infrastructure to, to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Keep safe, everyone. Until next time, uh, we'll be collating all the questions that we received, and uh, we'll we'll be using them for for content later on with our colleagues from CGAP as well for the Better Than Cash Alliance. So please keep tuned. And thank you once again for joining. Thank you.